Minister of State Sun Xueling, what kind of father is Dan going to be? Have your children ever voiced out that they wish you were around more? I'm not quite sure I should say this on the public podcast, but... Dan, are you ready to be a parent? I think so. This is your daily catch-up. It hasn't been too long since Dan announced that he's going to be a father, Woo! but little Ollie is actually due in four months. Still a long time, still a long time. No, that's short to me, man. Still a short time, still a short and time. And because none of us are parents ourselves, we've invited Minister of State Sun Xueling, a mother of two, to help him prepare for this next chapter of his life. Just for this. Uh... Welcome to the show! Welcome, Welcome to the show! Ooh, we love parents! We love Jesus of State. <laughs> MOS Sun is the Minister of State for Ministry of Social and Family Development and the Ministry of Home Affairs. MOS Sun is also the mother of two girls. Mm. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> How old are they? I think, I believe you mentioned uh, before. Seven and 10. Seven and 10, yes. okay. Based on our conversations with like other ministers, right? Ministers, mm. ministers of state. Politics just sounds like a 24 seven job. Mm. Yeah. You once were so busy that you brought your daughter's homework to a press conference. Yes. Huh? <laughs> Wait, but what about your notes? I didn't bring them. Well, I, I do know my brief, so I don't exactly have to rely on my notes, but uh. it was quite funny when I took out my file because it was a clear folder. Uh. And I remember she was learning numbers and it was like number blocks. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like 10 <laughs> blocks plus seven equals 17 kind of thing. I was like, oh, this is really helpful for my press briefing. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine the journalist or like the, the photographer like zooming in. Like, Lucky oh. he or she didn't, but my fellow panelists looked at it and I was like wondering what is this? But I guess the question is like, how do do you like personally juggle between the responsibilities of being a parent mm. and having such a full-time job? I think it's important to stay positive. Huh? Um, <laughs> really, <laughs> seriously. I don't just mean it as a slogan or something because if if you're negative about it, I mean, what does negativity do for you? Actually, it makes you feel down, maybe depressed and actually does it really help the situation? Not really, right? And but have your children ever voiced out that they wish you were around more? Yes, in fact, it was my seven-year-old's birthday yesterday. Oh, oh happy um, birthday! <laughs> <laughs> and I did ask her what she would, you know, like her oh birthday no, wish. Ah. She did say that I wish everybody would spend more time at home and just be around. Everybody. Everybody, like <laughs> she mom, dad, everyone. She was being dad, very everyone. politically correct, like very diplomatic <laughs> about that. How do you feel when you heard that kind of thing? I would do my best. Ah. Yeah. Well, the other way of doing it is to actually bring my child along when I have um, certain duties and that she could be involved in. Like for example, my work's in Pongo, there are many young children, so bring her along. Like mm. tomorrow I have Deepavali celebrations, there is some children's concert. So I'm making plans to bring my children along. All right, so as the only parent in this- On this panel right panel, now. For mm. the next four months. <laughs> <laughs> what is some advice you would give to a first time parent like Dan? Mm. Like some things you wish you knew like when you started out as a parent. Don't overthink and don't be stressed. Really. Wow, that's literally me really, right now. Really, really. Yeah. Because uh, your mood will impact your wife's mood. <sighs> and then your wife's mood will impact the newborn. Okay. Yeah, so you're supposed to look at it positively, okay? So be happy, bring your wife out for walks, you know, watch happy movies. If she's in a good mental state, yeah. the child will likely, you know, um, it's, oh. develop It's so health. strange because we're doing yeah. everything opposite at the moment. So like, I'm the one that is stressing out more than her. Uh -huh. She's watching murder and crime shows. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I feel like, like because um, we've always like compensated each other, right? Whenever I'm more stressed, she ends up being more stoic. So I feel like she's becoming more positive because I'm not. And why are you so stressed? I, I, mean, I keep reading up on like stuff <laughs> that I really shouldn't. Like there's so many incidents or things that can happen before. So like now we're in week 22. Mm. Between now and, and the birth, that could be uh, uh, one of a thousand of different like things that could have happened. And then even after birth, there's like things like SID and things like that. So I'm just like filling myself with so many negative thoughts that I think it's not really healthy. La. Yeah, and I think this is one of the... Um, difficulties that our generation faces huh? because a lot of us, we get facts from Dr. Google yeah. and um, a lot of it sometimes borders on the negative mm. and if you're not careful, you could go down a rabbit hole and end up being quite depressed and anxious uh, when you really shouldn't because parenthood should be something that you look forward to. Yeah. You know, think about all the positive things. I mean, if uh, childhood wasn't great, then uh, I mean, we look around us, we are healthy individuals. Yes, happy? Yes. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> as as, as <laughs> we can be. <laughs> yeah. no. I, I manage. <laughs> and I think the important thing is that 
we all can do something about it. Uh. So mm. when you're feeling stressed now, there's actually something you can do about your own mood. Like what I mentioned earlier, whether it's listening to music, going out for a walk, mm. you know, talking to your wife and all that. You know, there are actually things that you can do. And I would recommend physical activities to do together because actually a lot of things about anxiety, depression is because you are thinking a bit much. Uh, yeah. yeah, stuck in our own head. Yeah. Mm. Was there anything that you learned from your first pregnancy that you then adopted for your next pregnancy, like the second pregnancy? Mm. Um, I think exercise is important. I'm not quite sure I should say this on the public podcast, but I delivered my first one in half an hour. Whoa! Whoa. It was half an hour labor? Yeah. No way! No, from the time I got to the hospital to when the child came out, half an hour. Is it because you wait until very late then you go in? <laughs> but was it like uh, natural? Or? Natural, natural, natural. And okay. I, I attribute to the fact that I walk a lot now. And oh. you know, so if you are in better, better physical shape, I think delivery can be easier. But of course, it is subject to a lot of other conditions. Uh, you know, you're, yeah. uh, obviously everyone is made differently, but I do think that <laughs> exercise before, um, you know, before delivery is helpful. Yeah. Okay, so results not guaranteed, don't expect half an hour labor as well, <laughs> but but exercise would definitely help no matter but what. But isn't the average like time for childbirth- 16 like, hours. 16 yeah. hours. That was mother, what? 17 yeah, hours. Yeah, that's all I hear, like half yeah. a day or something. You just walked in and then bloop. Okay, my, I think my water bag broke maybe like two hours before, okay. but I can tahan. They told me to count, right? Like, you know, yeah. between contractions. The contractions. Contraction yeah, and, and then before I knew it, it was like, hey, uh, got to go like now. So are there any life changing products for Why? parents that you want to use to, as a first like you uh, want most to endorse products uh? I didn't have it when I was an expectant mother but I there's a lot of local research nowadays you could check out Gastu study okay um, which is by the Center for Holistic Development okay. which uh, talks about the importance of maternal well-being the importance of caregiver sensitivity the importance of the first 1000 days for child development mm. and I think that would be something that I think uh, young parents um, new parents uh, would want to know how about after you give birth right like yes. what are some things that maybe you didn't realize I think the husband's role is very important mm. Mm. Yeah. which is why paternity leaves have been increased yes. or will be you, increased you, by you, you should also I think postnatal you know the mood of the mother Yeah, I think you should also be you know helpful and positive and encouraging I feel I'll be like such a negative so energy. the best thing you should do I think is just to be relaxed calm happy wow. yeah. positive imagine if your child can't like you know just like an infant right look up and then every day you see like your father like frowning at you <laughs> worrying, <laughs> looking at you you'll be wondering like what is this world I've been born into I've told myself for like the, the two weeks or one month of paternity that I have I will be the brightest ball of sunshine <laughs> that oh my wife oh. despite the two oh. hours of sleep that's I'll so just, sweet I'll have a little post-it note above like my mirror or something to remind me to do that I, I, you'll be fine whether right? I can practice or not is a, yeah. is a different story yeah. but, uh, but it's at least endeavor. good to at least start out with this theoretical construct in your mind right yeah. 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 Yes. Wow. very do theoretical construct <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so the whole purpose of this episode is to help Dan right I'm sure you have and a, for us to get to know more son uh, also uh, no, uh, no, it's okay I'm, I'm very killing interested killing two birds too. with one stone okay. we are killing two birds with one stone we, we Posit- overkill yeah, on the positivity yeah. so let's not use the words kill yes yeah. Yeah. Oh, overdrive yeah. Yeah. Yes. to navigate we're here to navigate yeah. Navigate fatherhood, yes. We're here to navigate fatherhood with the help of Moss Sun and we want to like develop a framework and like uh. kind of crystallize like what kind of father is Dan going to be? Okay. Wow. Yeah. We are so scientific. Let's yeah. do it. I love this. Is this why you Thanks, went to today? No, this is my new look. Yeah, get used to it. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> So maybe we start off with a quiz. Oh, I have a fun one. Okay. Mm. So question one, there's a birthday party and your child was not invited. Do you ring the other kid's parents and demand <laughs> no, an explanation? Of course not. Ooh. Ooh. But what if something is going on like your child might be getting left Bullied out? Mm-hmm. Color. My, dun, 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 dun. my child can be happy on her own. But what if she's not? Well, I actually <laughs> asked my child this theoretical question before and it's Ooh. actually true. Ooh. It really happened. I told her, uh, what if one day you find out that nobody loves you? My <laughs> Wait, sorry, this is your child? How old when you asked them this? Your first child nine. was born in 2016. Nine. nine. Yeah. Oh, nine. And she looked at me and she said, I love myself and that counts as one. Sick. Wow. Okay. Shout out. So, <laughs> mm. so wow. no, I'm not going to call their mother. Yeah. Do, do you feel but that I hope you, she continues that way? You yeah. were lucky in terms of the the child lottery that <laughs> your child happened to be like this, or was it particularly like her upbringing and, and your parenting skills? I think there is a mix of nature and nurture. Okay. So I have two daughters, and definitely their personalities uh, are very different. Oh. So I think my younger one is um pr- would really like to be. Um, involved, you know, and part of a community more so than the elder one. Mm. But once you recognize their individual strengths and weaknesses, then you know how to kind of, as a parent, 
balance it out a bit and try to help one where she's weaker in certain aspects and, you know, help to manage and roughen up, uh, sorry, to kind of blunt the edges uh, okay. for them. Yeah. Do you think you parented both your children the same? Because usually mm. like the first one is the practice, <laughs> then the second <laughs> run, like you do better, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Hold up! Comment down below, I love you, mom. Or dad. Mm-hmm. Sure, either works. And don't forget like, share and subscribe. And back to the episode. So far, I've tended to address them together. So I don't think I have a different mm. uh, style. But one thing I did notice was my first one got into a lot more accidents than the second one. What do we mean accidents? Uh, <laughs> like she would run and fall. She would try to run before she even knew how to walk properly. You know, okay. a lot of things. But it's a function of her personality, right? Yeah. You know, which is, I want to go and try. Mm. Whereas my second one, I used to laugh quite a fair bit when she was in diapers and she was learning how to walk. Sorry, baby, if you're watching this. <laughs> um, and she would, stand up, take a few little tentative steps and then sit down straight on her bum again. <laughs> so because, oh. it, it, you know, it's like yeah. safety. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, so yeah, she yeah. wouldn't fall. Okay, you okay. know, when she was learning to walk. Yeah. Whereas my first one, every image, every photo I have of her, she's like running with her her head forward, body forward, arms behind. Ah, yeah. Naruto style. <laughs> Shanti Barilla <laughs> says that's good form. <laughs> but what's a back straight? <laughs> Do you always try to step in if your child is upset after falling out with a friend? Ooh. I'm thinking hard because it hasn't happened. So it's a hypothetical mm. situation. Finally. But I will <laughs> want to, but yeah, I will, I will want to find out why she's upset now. Yeah. Okay. But I think what's important is not to judge. You know, sometimes kids will tell you like some, something has happened and then from an adult's perspective, you're like, uh, why is that even an issue? You know, kind of thing. Ooh, yeah, so okay. we shouldn't have those perspectives because it really means the world to the child. It's interesting because I was talking to a friend and then like her parent, like, I think as a parent, like having gone through certain things in life, mm -hmm. you will want to prevent your child from making the same mistakes. Or if there's a clear shortcut that you know because you have lived the life before, right? You mm -hmm. would want to provide them that path. But then- her like as a child she felt like she needed to like walk her own path and yeah. experience that because it's always gonna be like a what if to her yeah, yeah. i'm always curious about this because like you mentioned about not putting that perspective that you have like on on the child right because mm -hmm. like certain things may, may seem like the world is ending because like my friend no longer wants to talk to me mm -hmm. but i feel like how much of it do you try to go actually take a step back, it's fine. Like I've gone through that and it will all be okay. Or do you let them go through that grief so that they can come out of it yeah, on their own? Yeah. Personally, I don't really like to adopt the approach of um, telling them that, ah, oh, you'll be fine. You know, I've gone through that before, that right. approach. Because to a child, it may sound like you're belittling his or her mm. experience. Try to analyze actually what happened, you know, okay. and go step by step. And I think in the process, you are also, it's almost like a, you know, a tree diagram, right? Like this happened and what next and what next. So is that decision making and then, you know, so it's step by step. So I think it actually helps the child process and you actually understand your child better through that process as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you hear this happening at home and yes. then what do you do? Okay. Hey, that's my controller. Give no, it back. No, you already play for two hours, really? I want to play the game. <laughs> no, but you're giving me the sport controller. I want to use the real no, controller. No, the controller got problem. <laughs> God, the button don't work. Mommy said you can play for one hour. I play for one hour. I only but play for 15 minutes. I got 10 more minutes. Okay, it's end scene. Uh, <laughs> well, if you continue like that, then you both do not have a controller. Oh! oh. And the amount of time you spend arguing over the controller, you both probably already had would have had your chance at the controller. That's true. Mm. You're sneakily quite scary. When you say <laughs> right, in a good way, in a good way, like, okay, discipline. Yeah, I can no, see. No, it's it. the gentle voice. Yeah. It comes with the oh, gentle voice. That's true, it's that's the true. flames behind the The next eyes. time you do that, <laughs> you are dead. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. it's like, how you're saying it is so calm, but what you're saying is not calm at all. Okay, so that brings me to the last question. Do you monitor your child's screen time? Ooh. Uh, well, currently they don't own their own computer. Mm. So mm. the screen time is really TV and the TV is in the living room so I can see what they're watching. Uh. Yeah. So okay. I don't know whether they call it monitoring or not. But how yeah. about the amount of time that they spend watching TV? I prefer that they not spend too much time um, <laughs> because it's not. But actually the research shows that if your child is very young, like under 18 months, the child should not have screen time. Yeah. So for mm. fathers to be, that is something <laughs> that you might want to pay attention to. But my children are 10 and 7. So they, they are able to process. Uh. Right. Mm. Um, but I do pay attention to what they watch. So I don't really mm. like like very rowdy or noisy cartoons because I find that it tends to hyper, you know, overstimulate hyper them. Okay. And then they end up speaking like that, which I don't really like. Uh, like uh, mirroring right. the characters. Yeah. Yes. So I try to get them to watch 
to me, uh, it's like, you know. Paw Patrol. <laughs> yes, Paw Patrol. <laughs> I, I particularly like, uh, what is it called now? Bluey and Bingo, do you know? Oh, wow. really know, Australian. Uh, I only know Doraemon. Bluey and Bingo. Okay, I'll take note of that. Yeah, house. Australian. Um, okay. Yeah, and it's, you know, family values, but it's, 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 it's good fun. Very good fun. But then your daughter yeah. start like picking up an Australian accent. But it's not so- <laughs> <laughs> no, the man. worst Australian accent. <laughs> Call me and then- <laughs> But Congratulations, yeah. you almost ended up as an armchair parent, but thankfully you're a lighthouse oh, parent. That's the best one. It's the best one. So you're oh. there to highlight dangers and uh-huh. gently point out safer options, and you achieve a healthy mix of being involved when needed and stepping away to let them develop. Yeah. Congratulations! Woo! That's the best one. Okay, yeah. thank you. Like a true experience parent. <laughs> yeah. In addition to that, right, I actually found in my research that there's actually four parenting styles and they were first developed in the 1960s by psychologist wow. Diana mm. Bermond. That person developed three styles and then in the 1980s, ah. Stanford researchers added one more. Okay, okay. Mm. Yeah. The four styles are authoritarian. Mm-hmm. My mother. <laughs> Even without hearing the <laughs> it sounds It sounds bad. Yeah. So they are obedience oriented and expect their orders to be obeyed without explanation. Why? Because I told you so. <laughs> and wow. so far. I told you so is really <laughs> yeah. bringing back some trauma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they have high expectations and provide little direction on what to do or avoid. Uh, this leads to obedient and proficient children, uh-huh. but they often rank lower in happiness, social competence, and self-esteem. I think I'm quite socially competent though. Yes. Sorry, that, that, that yes. <laughs> yeah, you should have waited like uh-huh. me. Yes, Denise, I agree. Thank you. Wait, do you think you grew up in an authoritarian household? It was only until a certain age that I realized how strict my parents were. Because, uh. so last time it's like, you know, you go from the daily allowance. Then after I see all my friends start getting weekly or monthly allowance, right? Then I still on daily. Then it's to the extent that like, if I want to buy a bubble tea, Mm. then I have to call my mom and ask whether I can buy that kind. Ah, so oh. that was the extent of it. And then like when my friends were like, started asking like, how huh, you need to call your mom this kind? Then I realized, eh, <laughs> do y'all not call your mom like, before you buy mm. anything? <laughs> then it did come to a stage where I felt like I wanted to like act out. Mm. How old were you then? I think in JC actually. Oh, oh wow. Okay, okay. 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 I think because like all you? along, like the decisions like turned out well. Mm. Then it was until JC, then I got to choose my own CCA. And he's like, oh my God, I have choice. Uh, <laughs> is this what free will feels like? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But then I choose my OCC and after I retain, then oh. my mom was like, oh, that's not the way to go. <laughs> the one that you have <laughs> free will and choice. Look what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was the moment where I was a bit conflicted. Like, oh no, is it like, now that I have the free will, is it I really don't know how to do anything like on my own in a sense. Yeah. So then that was when I was a bit like afraid, but I don't think I resented them for it because I think that my life went very smoothly. Mm. Mm in how they raised me. Even though I do agree that like the last sentence says like, I do feel like a bit caged at certain points. La. That was type one, authoritarian. Mm. And the next one is actually authoritative. So it's similar to the authoritarian style, but more democratic. Authoritative <laughs> parents still expect a lot from their children, <laughs> but are also open to questions and provide warm f- feedback and adequate support. The goal is to raise socially responsible, self-regulated children who have independence and self-control. Have you guys heard of baby led weaning? Basically the, the whole concept is derived from like the, the, the first step of it is about feeding your child. And so mm-hmm. like instead of like feeding your child from the ages of like six months, right? You actually provide them with like chunks of food that allow them to kind of feel the texture and be able to feed themselves eventually. So that when you're in a restaurant, right? What happens is that you are out with your friends and then you have your kid and then you can't really talk to your friends because you you're busy with the kid or thinking of the kid. In situations where it's done really well, I know of friends who, they can just visit their friend's house and their child is just feeding themselves and it's like they're one year old and they're completely fine. But I think the larger principle you're talking about is the fact that you said baby led, right? Yeah. Whereby basically you're taking the cues from the child, mm. right? Mm. So I think actually, Nowadays, um, like the Gusto study was talking about, right? Um, there's a lot of research around caregiver sensitivity, which is like you're taking cues from the child about a lot of things uh, like play, like what does a child need? What are their emotional needs at the moment? So in this specific example, it was baby led weaning, which was about food. Uh, yeah. But it's about um, taking the cues from the child. And there are, there are some, I think, uh, positive uh, elements to that because your child could be really interested in going on to solid foods and no longer be drinking milk but you may actually not know what the child needs if you just keep on giving the child the bottle, right? Yeah. Um, so I think there is some, um, you know, uh, positive elements to it, but I think you have to be a sensitive caregiver in the first place. Um. If you're too busy, mm. if you yourself are 
all over the place or you're just not physically present in the first place, you then don't have how a pulse on, yeah. you, you don't have a sense of what the child needs. Right? So yeah. I think that actually the most important thing is do you want to be a sensitive caregiver? Mm. If you want to be, then you probably have to set aside time for it and you, you probably want to be paying attention to details. Um, and then you are able to see certain patterns that your child is developing and then you can then decide that, okay, th my child is actually trying to tell me something. Yeah. And this is not just a whim and a fancy at a, at a point in time. Uh. So yes. speaking of being involved, you can actually be too involved because uh -huh. the third Category, style yeah. is the The way you do three is damn gross. I wasn't doing a three. <laughs> <like this. laughs> oh my God. So what's the third point? The third yeah. point is the permissive parenting style. So uh -huh. permissive parents want to be a friend first uh -huh. and a parent second. Ooh. Rarely set up and enforce rules and allow their children to make their own decisions. What are rules? The armchair yeah. parent. While the relationship between the parent and child may be better than the other styles, mm -hmm. this may result in a lack of self-regulation and respect for authority. For a long time, I always thought I want to be my child's best friend. And then as I'm hearing myself, it was super cringe. And so I realized, no lah, like there's a time and place for that. I need to be able to, or like my wife and I need to be able to like instill some discipline, some balance, some balance. But it's not bad to start off with that, no, because okay. you'll find out that when you're faced with certain challenges, when your child is making a ruckus and doing a lot of things, you may be asking yourself, am I able to continue being a permissive parent? Yeah. Mm. So I'm not too sure when a scenario actually arises, whether you will actually be able to act that construct that you have in your mind. Okay. Oh, she really uncovering some stuff. Yeah. Right now. Uh, let's find yeah. out in a year's time. <laughs> Ooh. 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 You can come back for an update. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How has it been? One year of permissive parenting. Do you feel like your kids are are honest with you? Very, you, very. I think they are. What, what are. do you think is the reason for that? Is it because you've always been open with them? You've always been that, that open book? Or is there anything that you told them early on? If there's anything, please always come to me. Okay. I, I think when you give general principles to the child, the child actually probably doesn't really understand. Mm. But if you tell mm. a child, I'm going to be open with you, yeah, the child oh. will be like, uh, actually, what does that mean? Oh. And the opposite sometimes. The yeah. uh, so I think it's more important that actually day to day, you actually act and behave the way you think in your mind, you, you want to be behaving. Yeah. So if I say mm. I'm open and I want to be open, then actually what I should be doing is if my child comes to me with a problem, then I really actively listen to what the problem is without judging. Uh, mm. Without saying, oh, you're bad, this is wrong. You know, um, I, I don't think that that's particularly encouraging. Uh. And sometimes when you do that, the conversation shuts down. Mm. Mm. You don't even, it, it becomes like a yes, no. And then after a while, the child just goes away and children remember, you know. Uh, oh my God. So this was the one that was added in the 1980s. Uh, yeah. And it's the- Stanford professors. Might be a sign of the times, but the uninvolved slash neglectful parent. That's the fourth one, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so the fourth one. <laughs> uninvolved <laughs> and neglectful parents will fulfill a child's basic needs, uh -huh. but offer little to nothing in the way of guidance, structure, rules, or support. Mm. A 2019 study found that children raised by the uninvolved slash neglectful parents tend to struggle in school, experience depression and anxiety, have worse social relationships, and have difficulty controlling their that emotions. That sounds even worse than the first time. Yeah. I think there's a there's actually like a space in parenting for the first type, but this one does sound like- <laughs> There's no parenting don't, don't involved. Do it, don't do it. I mean, it sounds like you have a pretty good grasp on like raising your children? Or no. Great. <laughs> Follow up question. What's been the most, uh, you know, like difficult uh, aspect of your parenting journey so far? I think many times parents struggle with how to set boundaries for their children, mm. um, which is actually, if you, if you think about it, right, the gradient between your authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and uninvolved and neglectful is about how well you set the boundaries. Whether you're drawing solid lines yeah. or, mm. or whether you're dotting the lines or whether you don't even have a line, right? Isn't it? So I think that's the question that parents always ask themselves as and when situations happen. Mm. And then when the children grow up and then if something happens, touch wood, then you ask yourself, is it because I didn't parent well enough? And that's that question I think I have today and would continue to have as any parent because if you love your child and if things don't go well and things will, in, I mean, inevitably there'll be things that don't go well, right? And I think parents would, ask themselves, is it because of something I did or did not do? Uh? Mm. Yeah. Like, I think my biggest fear is because if we look at any like aspect of our life, right? When we were in school, when we got a job as a partner, mm. like there was always a feedback system, whether it was a scorecard, a report book, like mm. appraisal, even with your partner, there's conversations, you break up, you become better, your next like relationship there was always a scorecard to kind of like grade yourself. And with mm. parenting, it's weird because one, there is no standard mm. um, across the board and the feedback that you 
get right it might be sometimes too late because when your child is able to feedback to you how they may have felt like mm. as you as a parent they've already gone through your parenting and has affected <laughs> them for years already true so you can't replay yeah. right and you can't reenact and, and do all that right but I wanted to <laughs> to say right that how I console myself <laughs> is that at least from what I can see now my children love me right and I think whatever we have shared about how our parents you know how they brought us up I think the, the commonality from what I'm hearing so far is that you have fond memories of what happened mm. you know you all think that you have grown up well and you mm. are socially competent <laughs> that's what you said you know and then we, we love our parents right so regardless whether they had done right or wrong um, fundamentally children still love them and, I, and that's how I console myself uh, that whatever it is my children don't blame me well, at least fingers crossed up to today, <laughs> that is so. <laughs> and as a MOS for the Ministry of Social and Family Development, right? Maybe <laughs> what, a <laughs> what a segue. What a segue. What are some of the more common problems that uh, parents are facing today? Ooh. Well, what I would say is that from where I stand, I have a lot more opportunity to interact with people, right? Mm. From all walks mm. of life. Yeah. And I would say that many parents are feeling very stressed. There is always a, a concern that if the adults are stressed, you could transfer that stress to the child. Yeah. Right? Even though the child may or may not understand why you're stressed, but they will know if mommy or daddy is not in a good mood, right? Mm. Um, and that might affect how the children feel about themselves, you know, or how they can respond to situations around them. Hence my point, I think when we started our conversation, <laughs> right? Well, my suggestion was don't overthink and relax because the children would, would turn out fine and everyone would bloom and in their own time and season. And I think we probably shouldn't overthink it. Yeah. But also it's a touchy subject because parents feel like they are doing what's best for their child. So yeah. then how, how does MSF kind of navigate the messaging mm. across the board while also mm. trying to be sensitive to like parents' own point of view? I think just as much as I said that we shouldn't judge children, we should not try to judge parents. Yep. We should always have the starting point that like exactly like what you said, parents mean the best and they want to do their best for their child, mm. right? They mean well. The question is how do we help them do their best for their child and do the right and positive things? Uh? Mm. So I think firstly, the starting point has to be that so that parents don't actually feel adverse to whatever <laughs> advice uh, that whether MSF or MOE wants to provide. Yeah. Uh, they do not feel judged. I think what we want to be able to do is to have many activities and create an environment where it is possible to bring up children in a affordable manner, mm. uh, in a meaningful manner, um, and to have different strokes for different folks. Uh. <laughs> so if your child is, uh, let's say, a very sporty child, then you may want to look at what kind of community activities that can be, that can be whereby active children can go out there and play a sport. Right? If your child is very musically inclined, then what are the affordable uh, channels whereby your child can actually strengthen their talents in that area? You mentioned like affordability, right? Mm. And I think like actually one of the reasons <laughs> why my wife and I don't want children, right, is actually mm. about the whole like affordability of it all. But why do you so, think bringing up a child is expensive? Yeah, so a TikTok user, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she posted a breakdown of everything that she spent on her child in mm. the first year mm. and she went up to How about $34,000. Wait, first year, the first child year. birth. Uh, yes, Including. delivery right there, $6,727. So cheap. But, but that's not the bulk of it, you see. So the remaining? Ah, uh, oh, should, okay, I list, should, did, should I list everything? There's a lot of luxury. She did court banking. Huh? What's that? Oh, oh, court blood. Yeah, oh, court, court blood blood. banking, oh, 6,888. Yeah. I mean, this was just a starting point for my concerns. Like, this is just a, uh, one example of it. But like, I also remember, like, I think I was speaking to John. He was mentioning that childcare fees are like $2,000 a month. That is a non anchor operator and non partner operator. Is it so a it's, private? Is a private? It's a private. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So currently, about sixty over percent of the preschool sector is supported by the government, and what mm. I mean by that is that there are actually fee caps uh, for anchor operators mm. and partner operators. Okay. Um, so the fee cap for anchor operators is six hundred eighty dollars. Oh. Uh, whereas <laughs> for partner operators is seven hundred twenty, and that's before subsidy. Oh. So oh, if okay. you're hey. If your wife is working, she's entitled to a three hundred dollar working mother subsidy. Working, working mother wife. subsidy. Uh, How about working father subsidy? Uh, Another three hundred. That's eighty dollars. Just said the wrong expectations. Just kidding. 
<laughs> the government has already announced that by 2025, mm. we want the government supported segment of the market to be as high as 80%. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So in, in other words, there is capacity and there, there is an availability of uh, mm. places uh, for you to send your child to. But that is by building more preschools or by yes. oh, okay. building okay. More preschools. <laughs> closing up private no, Building more preschools <laughs> and, and, more. and for some preschools, uh, depending on the centres where they are, if it's possible to build extensions, we'll build uh, I, I think we probably have to break it down to like, mm. what are your initial, I was going to say startup costs. <laughs> okay, but sure. yeah. 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 yeah, it makes sense. It's fair enough, right? Uh, and then what subsequently is your operational <laughs> cost? Yeah, 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 right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There are certain things that are startup costs, like maybe the cost of a court, yeah. um, the, 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 the cost of a pram, mm. you know. Baby proofing. Yeah. <laughs> it's one time, $462 for the court. And then that, <laughs> you kind of depreciate over the time that you use it for, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah, so there are certain costs like that which are bulky at the mm. start. And I think that's the that's the reason why, you know, there is the baby bonus cash gift, which I think it's eleven thousand dollars now for the first child. It is. Right. Yeah. So I don't know whether the number that you have is post probably even not subsidies included. I yeah, guess. because there's yeah. eleven thousand on the um yeah. baby bonus cash gift. Plus you could the CDA not as well. The CDA, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Child, child development, development uh, co savings account. So I I guess when we look at the cost, we have to ask ourselves what are good to haves mm. and what are like die die must have uh. But I think to each our own, we have different preferences. Like you mentioned affordability is one um, consideration for you um, yeah. about having children. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you think about it, certain things are really quite affordable in Singapore, right? Like for example, the cost of delivery in your hospital, as you could see, is not a big fraction. I expect them more that, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and um, subsequently preschool, there are options. So if you go for government supported, meaning the anchor operator of partner operated, uh, operators, then it's lower cost. Mm. Um, and also subsequently when the child grows up and goes into primary school, it's very affordable uh, because it's like, um, what, $6 or something a month. Mm. So like I've, I've heard of friends sending their kids to like preschool as early as like three years old. But then I remember that when I went to preschool, I was like probably like five and I don't know whether like, is it getting <laughs> earlier and earlier like sending kids to well, school? Well, times have changed. Okay. Indeed, because <laughs> I <think> times <laughs> have gotten <laughs> earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the research shows that children do start learning very early okay. and that actually three is a very good age to start sending your children to three. school. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, but before we start thinking about preschool whereby it's like academics and all that, right? I mm. mean, when children go to school at a young age, a lot of what they're learning is about making friends, playing. Oh. Oh. So it's really oh. about so, so socio-emotional socio learning. The soft skills. Uh, yeah, but it's important. It is. Because, it is. <laughs> because you learn how to be... Uh, you know, resilient, you, 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 you learn about, um, you know, how to work with other people, social, cue, social cues, you know, and all that, and language development. Yeah. Actually, the statistics for children attending preschool three and above is 88%. That's the national oh. uh, uh, average national number. But oh, yes. lower income families, uh, because they face so many multifaceted challenges, right? It's about 10% lower, okay. that's 78%. Right. And that's uh, one key area that um, government programs uh, like Kidstart, for instance, working with Comlink families, you know, these are families in rental housing mm, who have young okay. children. Um, we really want to encourage them to send their children to school early yeah. from mm. three onwards. And very importantly, to make sure that their children frequently attend free preschool. Yeah. I mean, speaking of early childhood education, I think one thing that I wanted to get your opinion on, right, is mm. that mm. We, we did an episode previously on the Kinderland incident. Uh, oh. yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you must have received oh. so many emails. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, I did discuss that issue in parliament, actually. Oh. There were 40 over questions raised. I mean, there were definitely things that ought not to have happened mm. and lessons we have learned whereby we need to uh, better our processes. Uh. When we know that a child is in danger, the teacher needs to be, that have to have her duties stopped. I think that needs to be quickly acted upon. Mm. So I think for the Kinderland episode, that was identified as, um, I think the response to us that was not timely enough mm. um, in, in that the teacher uh, um, should have been removed from her duties earlier on. Yep. That's number one. Um, number two, I think what we also learned is that the culture in preschools is important. Uh, so that culture of care, respecting children, not using corporal punishment uh, on them. The way you talk to children, the way you respond to children, you must use right. positive uh, methods rather than negative methods. Uh. So actually we have a lot of that in um, the codes of practice that um, 
the early childhood industry is bound by. But what is important is how it's actually being implemented on the ground. Are centre leaders doing it? Are centre leaders reminding their educators about it? And what are the whistleblowing channels? Do teachers feel that they are empowered? Uh, should they want to um, report about certain things that are happening that they are not comfortable with? You know, mm. I think all those things um, we have looked back at um, our existing codes of practice and where it's necessary to actually improve on them, we will. So one key thing we're doing is that we're actually listing out more scenarios uh, which we would put into the training for educators. Okay. For example, a child is acting up, you know. So in the past where it could be like, uh, you may want to pull out the child and have the child come down in a corner what does that actually mean? Do you right. mean isolate and put in a dark corner? Or do you mean isolate the child, but actually you are still there to be watchful mm, over yeah. the child, but you let the child know that actually you've done something that you should not have. And that's why you're being pulled out from your class. So we have, uh, we have decided that we want to make um, the scenarios uh, more detailed so that educators who haven't encountered it themselves would know how to respond when these incidents actually do happen. Leave yeah. fewer things to interpretation as well. So it's yeah. a lot clearer. Yeah. And also one last thing is that what are the penalties? when we know mm. that there is abuse, um, uh, whether or not there should be personal liability, um, you know, uh, whether we should raise financial penalties um, and, you know, what are the roles and responsibilities of our centre leaders and uh, what should be the associated penalty if they are found to be negligent. So all these things are being reviewed. Uh, one thing I mentioned during the that discussion that we had about the Kindland episode mm. is that I kind of uh, equated there might be a problem with preschool educators in the way there's a problem with healthcare workers in Singapore of like how there's too much work to be done, mm. but there is not enough people to do it. And because of that work load, then it becomes a less attractive like mm. career to be pursuing. Mm. So like, I'm wondering if there was like a mm. shortage of childcare or educators. Or cause and effect yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think in the care sector for which you talked about healthcare workers and preschool educators, we definitely need more uh, people in these sectors. Definitely we are ramping up recruitment efforts. Uh, and, and the important thing is obviously when you want to ramp up recruitment efforts, you want to make the sector more attractive, right? So when okay. people look at whether a sector is attractive enough, it's about whether there are promotion uh, aspects to it and obviously what are the financial incentives? Yeah. Is there a skills ladder which then leads to improved pay? Mm. And generally what are the work conditions? But coming back to was that the main reason why the abuse happened mm. in the Kinderland case? Um, from what I understand, I, I don't think that that's the case. Uh, but one thing, and, and that goes back to the point about what are the lessons we learned, what are the scenarios we have to so and so off, you know? Um, and we want to make sure we educate our educators, you know, so that they know how to respond when such incidents happen. Is that, and it comes back also to this issue about parenting that we've been discussing. Each and every one of us, right, as adults, we are a function of what happened to us in the past how we were brought up as children, right? So if an educator has in their mind that when I was brought up, my father beat me or someone beat me and I'm fine, good what? I'm very disciplined as a child. So he or she may then say, this is the right way to teach without knowing or realizing that current parenting methods do not encourage this anymore. Right, so I think this is the part, right, whereby we have to be careful. And especially because we are in the education industry, we're talking about very small children, right, who may not be able to verbalize their fear and their concerns or whatever abuse. Then we must make sure that our educators, regardless whatever background uh, or whatever lived experience they have, if they are a educator, then they must respect children and they must treat their young charges with love and care you know, and take care of them properly because that is their job and parents entrusted the children to them. So I think that's what's important. And I think yeah. that is what we learned as the most important fact arising from the Kinderland incident. Mm. And that's why we're strengthening the training, making sure that I don't care what background you come from. I don't care what qualifications you have. There are prerequisites, yes, but when you're going to be an educator in the childcare sector in Singapore, then you have to know what are the latest uh, research and methodologies and mm. pedagogies and you have to subscribe by them. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, do you think you've learned more about being a parent today? So much, so much. I mean, I, I think what's clear is that I clearly haven't read up enough yet. Hey, but you cannot overread, over right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Dude. 
All right, and that's it for today. This episode was brought to you by the Ministry of Social and Family Development. So big thank you to them. And of course, Moss Sun Shelley. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> we hope that today's episode has given you some insight into being a parent in 2023. And for more resources on parenting, you can head over to the links below. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. I'm very sad that Lala is going back home. Liao Yao, you mean? He was, oh, he, he, he was he was <laughs> always, <laughs> on food. He was always on the employment permit, you know that, right? I didn't oh, know. Yeah, I didn't like, know the deal was that if you give us two, we will give you one baby back. I didn't know that was the exchange. Oh, yeah. That's it's quite fair though. Okay, but I also don't know whether pandas in the wild are how dependent on their parents. So anyway, we've digressed. I mean, this can go into your because this is about parenting. <laughs> <laughs> don't, learn, don't learn parenting from the dolphins though. <laughs>